Okay, so we're going to look at uh, chapter 15, which is on general purpose timers. Um, and I, again, I'm going to sort of try to divide this up into both a section that um, includes just theory part and then another section that includes, you know, actually doing it on the microcontroller. Okay, so let's move ahead and the first thing that I think we should talk about is just how the timers in general on any of these microcontrollers is generally just a free running counter. So what that means is it has its own clock um, and it's independent of the processor itself and that each time you know the timer clock has a uh, an edge trigger that the counter counts and it doesn't it doesn't stop necessarily ever um, there are basically four functions that we can uh, do with our timers we can use it to capture an input like maybe we wanted to know um, the length of time between a pulse, something like that. We can choose uh, output compare, so it can compare two outputs, uh, compare two things and output something based on that. We can um, use it to do pulse width modulation, which is obviously good for things like motor controllers and so forth. Um, and we can also use uh, what's called a one pulse mode output, where we just you know maybe put a pulse out. Um, when some triggered event occurs. So let's just um, sort of talk in general about why time is important in the first place. Um, here it shows a couple of examples or main, mainly just one example. It says uh, why might we want to use these timers? Well we might want to use it to generate a wheel control signal for the DC motor of a robot. Typically these DC motors require pulse walk pulse width modulated signals and basically that signal is uh, a <clears throat> it's sort of a a pulse wave with a certain duty cycle and the higher the duty cycle the more the motor is on and we'll talk about that as we go through this but this is what it's sort of showing right here here we're putting out a pulse that has a certain period um, and the pulse is on for just a certain amount of time. This shows in this one that it's on 20% of the time, whereas on this one it's on 80% of the time. So in some sense, um, you're basically, if this is controlling a motor, that means the motor is on more of the time than it's not. Um, you can use this same process, which you'll we'll see at the end of the um, <clears throat> series of lectures when we're actually trying to Deter, uh, use it to determine, or not determine, but change the brightness of a LED, just like one of the LEDs that we've uh, got on our board. So it's showing that um, <clears throat> uh, is something important. And it says, um, you know, the other thing we could do to create a time delay is just use some sort of loop method where you, you know, you know the actual clock of the CPU, which in this case could be the exact same as the timer clock, but the timer clock can be derived from the uh, CPU. And actually, we're not really gonna go through that too much, but uh, I believe there is a, a <clears throat> and a video on Dr. Zhu's website that shows how you get the clock generation for a particular timer to do all the clock division and so forth. We'll talk about the registers and stuff, but I don't really think that's the most important um, in terms of how it mechanically goes through the uh, clock chain to actually get the timer clock. Um, anyways, we could use the loop method, but obviously that's um, sort of sitting there tying up the processor and everything uh, when we might want to create a delay. And if we're tying up the processor, then it can't do anything else. So that's maybe not the best um, use of the processor. So we have timers to sort of get us through that without having to implement it through loop delays. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, the clock and standard timer module for our discovery board um, is sort of interesting, but maybe not the most 
important considering we're just trying to learn how to use it. Um, the clock module uh, has, you know, clock generation circuitry, which, um, you know, it can be, you can get information externally for the clock signal, um, but you also uh, use this clock signal for the central processor of the discovery board as well as you know other on-chip peripherals like the timer that we just talked about. Um, for our standard timers you can see that we can measure the characteristics of an input signal, generate output signals to given specifications, that's the output compare stuff, and we can count events, that's the other thing we can do. Which you know some of these sort of all tie hand in hand and you'll see what I mean as we go through um, the ideas behind the different count different timer types. Um, we have uh, the general purpose timer TIM2. Um, it's a 32-bit binary stopwatch. Uh, again, we can use it for input capture and output compare. Um, it shows again that you know we might want to use uh, input capture to determine the pulse length of uh, input incoming signal. We can do it to determine the duty cycle of a signal. We can determine uh, use it to determine the frequency of a signal and so forth. Uh, we can use output compare to generate preci uh, precision digital signals. So basically remember this is not analog output. We've talked about that in the digital to analog converter. This is going to be a digital output but it can have uh, uh, pulses or square waves but then it, you know obviously de depending on the duty cycle that you want to use for your um, square wave, you can get different pulse width modulated signals. Um, the pulse accumulator here says it's you know used to count events, um, like how many times something happens. Um, <clears throat> and then finally we have the system registers uh, and programming that we're going to talk about at the end. Of course I think I'm going to divide that into a second video. Um, this is actually sort of a timing concept, and I think it's actually this is from the old HC12 microcontrollers book that that I used. But I sort of think it's a a simpler idea when you just don't have to do all the uh, timing characteristics that that it shows in the book. Basically, what the sig the significant signal characteristics are for us are basically when a pulse has a rising, rising edge, a falling edge, and the length of time in between it, and then maybe overall the, the time period that we have. Um, this talks right here about the on time versus the off time of a uh, pulse tells you about the duty cycle and you can see that definition is right here and we'll use that when we calculate the duty cycle for for the timing events for uh, the STM timers when we look at it in the future. And then of course if we can calculate the period, we can calculate the frequency by 1 over the period. Um, and so just remember this is a 32-bit timer uh, that we will be looking at. There is also, you can use a 16-bit timer as well um, on the discovery boards. But that gives us the ability to, you know, count up to 32 bits or 16 bits, depending on which we use. Um, okay, so this is the example, as I say, showing the counter from the HC12 or S12, and it's just trying to show some problems that any of these microcontrollers can have if you're doing timing and you need to be aware of it you know that the timer is always running and if it's counting to FFFF, FFFF, which is again that's the 32 bits, if it goes between zero and that value and then it rolls back over automatically, what can happen to timing events that you occur, that, that occur during that time? Well the simplest one is right here. Let's say you start at B000 and you know the timers run and run and run and run and then you check another event and it stops and it's E000. Well what happened? Did it only 
uh, not overflow at all as it counted out counted and that's what this is sort of showing and now again we have a little bit different example from the uh, in the discovery board because it doesn't talk about TOF like that but this is the way it talked about with the S12 and all of these microcontrollers will have something similar so you will know that the length of time was from here to here if you knew that you counted overflows and there weren't any well okay let's sort of say the same thing and we switch the start and stop times and the start time was E000 and the stop time was B000, B000. Well, for sure, since the stop time was a lower value in the count than the start time, we know there had to be at least one overflow. We can obviously check that right there. Um, and if we know that it's one, then we just know basically how to get the particular time would be this amount of time plus this amount of time. Um, now one of the things that it shows here is for us, you know, if we used the M clock and it was 16 megahertz, what is the period of, of what is the period of time for one count? And that would be 1 over 16 megahertz gives you the period uh, in length of time and then however many clock cycles you have that you're counting you would have to multiply it by this right here so um, that's what it's showing right here is if you calculated the elapsed time between um, this event right here you would take E000 minus B000 multiply it by um, 1 over 16 megahertz. Got to be careful there. And then the next thing that you have to figure out is okay, well, wait a minute. What have I have to track this uh, timer overflows because if I don't track that, then I don't know how many times, you know, I could have started right here it could have gone through, wrapped back around, and ended here. In that case I would get some number of timer overflows which it calls that. And here it uh, shows that particular case. Here's the opposite of that. It, it, it can go over and come back starting there and going, oops, excuse me, starting here and it can go around and come back and it can continue to go around you know it could go this way with two timer overflows and stop there and then um, finally you know it sort of shows the start and stop time being about the same and so it's going over and however many overflows you have and then it's showing you okay well if you if you want to know the overall number of clock counts, this would be the formulaic expression that you could get that would account for all the scenarios there. And so um, this is the 32 bytes or bits for FFFF, FFFF. And so this is the rollovers. And then um, you can see what's going on right here to give you the overall time. Okay, um, so for our main timer for the discovery board, you can look, we have a, this timer, it's programmable because we basically, as I said, we can change the clock that goes into it. It has um, a prescaler and other stuff that we'll talk about. But it's 16-bit or 32-bit counter, and it has its registers just like everything else associated with it has the auto reload register which is often referred to as ARR. Um, the counter in this case is different than the SC, S12 or HC12 microcontroller because this counter can count up, it can count down, or it can do both. And you know what I mean by that is count up and then back down. And as I said the counter itself can be divided by a prescaler. So uh, you have to be aware of that um, when you want to reduce the uh, 
frequency of the clock timer. It says the counter, the auto reload register, and the prescaler can be written to or read from by software. This is true even when the counter is running. So you don't have to stop and start it to do anything like that. It's always going. Um, so here you can see the particular um, registers that are important important for the timers, the counter register and the prescaler register and the auto <coughs> auto reload register. And notice the X again is showing for the different timers that you might have. Now what does this prescaler do? I already talked about it, but it says the prescaler can divide the counter clock frequency by any factor between 1 and 65,536. So that tells you right there the number of bits that that prescaler can be. Um, it is based on a 16-bit counter control through a 16-bit 32-bit register, it says here, the prescaler pre register, and it can be changed on the fly as this control register is buffered. So you can change what, you know, how the timer clock, you know, uh, has an edge and the frequency with which it does it. Um, on the fly, and so then if you if you did that, you know the t the next timer event, the next clock would take that into account that it's been changed. So you have to be aware of that, and and we'll talk a little bit about that. Obviously, that's not something you would do very often, but it is something you can do if you had maybe some particular event that you were wanting to look at, and you knew it occurred fast in time but then after you after you knew that event occurred then something else was going to occur but it was going to take a long time for that event to occur so maybe you want to change the clock to be slower so um, you can you know more easily calculate what's going on with a slower resolution um, and maybe I should you might say well why why would I want to do that well the bigger the biggest thing is okay if you keep the clock fast you can obviously have the smallest resolution and get the best accuracy but the power is um, gonna hit you the most if you have that clock running at its highest clock speed so the slower the clock will run the better your power um, you know savings is going to be okay so here um, is trying to show what's going to happen in um, just the up counting mode and, and we'll go through this before um, it's tr I think there's some better slides by this but it's saying okay what happens in the particular case when we have the the prescaler Here's the clock, and the prescaler is basically saying, okay, we're not going to prescale any. Here's the clock, the enable for the timer. So once that enable is hit, okay, now the timer can start. And because the prescaler isn't dividing anything, the prescaler and the uh, timer clock are the exact same. And then this is just showing the example of what happens with the count as remember the the it's always running it's just whether or not it's doing anything so this is saying the it's counting up to 36 and restarting so okay notice it's stuck here at 31 until we enable it and it can just be stuck there from whenever we started the stop counting stop the maybe I shouldn't say stop disabled the counter or whatever it stays there at that that same value once it's enabled and we hit the clock then it starts counting once it hits the maximum it's going to reset and start going again and we'll talk about this value in the next few slides but what it's trying to show you is when that happens a counter overflow is going to occur and an update event is going to occur and also the update interrupt flag is going to be set now we haven't talked about interrupts, but obviously if you're using interrupts, you can use that interrupt flag to go run some subroutine um, based on that. 
Okay. Um, so what about the clock for the timer? Talked a little bit about this, but it can use the internal clock. Um, it can use the external clock mode one or two, and <clears throat> it can get that from, you know, an external input, external input pin or the external trigger input. That's two different inputs that you can use. Um, and then you have the input trigger input, internal trigger inputs um, that says it can use one timer as a prescaler for another timer. And so that's sort of strange, but there's a bunch of timers on there. So it's saying, for example, here you could configure timer 13 to actually act as the prescaler for timer two. Um, so obviously that's getting different thing, different um, possibilities that you can use. We're just trying to basically use the basic benefits of the timer. So we're not going to have to do any of the crazy external clock mode inputs. Um, we're just going to use the internal clock for the timer. Um, okay. Now, again, let's reiterate. What are we trying to do with the timers? Well, when we're uh, wh when we're looking at timers with input signals, we can use them to measure the period of an incoming signal or the frequency of an incoming signal or so forth. When we're looking at them as outputs, <coughs> we can generate a square wave or pulse width modulated wave. And then the other thing we could do is we could use it to con you know, just count different events. Um, we could use it to control other peripherals or just you know, different events in time and software that may not actually be an external input from somewhere else. Okay, again, uh, this is just sort of a repeat slide, but it's actually giving more of a block diagram for the timer. Um, and so I'd like to point out that each timer has its own register here. Uh, this is the uh, count register. Um, <clears throat> and it can either count up or down or sort of both. Um, and it's uh, driven by a clock source that you can see is over here and we talked about okay here's the normal clock source um, coming in from the prescaler the prescaler sets whatever you want the uh, prescaler to be and then the resulting clock that goes into the timer is shown here um, and it shows here that the the <clears throat> clock count is actually the prescaler clock value so this is sort of like maybe you should say the clock before the prescaler divided by what do you have for the prescaler plus one so this is telling you that that's the uh, the bit combination that you put in for the prescaler register and it has the auto reload register okay so when we look at that um, <clears throat> We need to again realize that this, you know, once this clock is set up going into the counter, that is a free running clock, free running counter, um, and it counts up or down, you know, by some specific amount each time. And you'll see what I mean by that. Um, well, I guess you could say it does count up or down by one automatically, but you can get it to do things based on every single count or whatnot. And again, we'll talk about it. So uh, by updating this prescaler register, um, we can you know, get the clock rate that we desire. Um, and it says here, the prescaler enables a trade-off between timer resolution and timer range. I talked about that previously. High timer resolution is good because it gives us a high clock rate and we can really determine, you know, sp specific short time spans between different inputs or create a real high frequency output, whatever. But it has the problem that it takes more power. And then in addition to that, 
is going to have lots of overflows and underflows that we'll have to take uh, into account. And that is specifically something that we will be looking at in lab. Uh, and that's because, hey, if you can count time or anything, the best thing to do if you know the length of time is to try to do something where you don't have any of these overflows or underflows that you would have to worry about. Um, okay, so the other thing that it wants to point out here is that um, you have the capture, compare and capture register that along with the counter can give you this timer output that's the output compare um, <clears throat> uh, reference. And so this is how you can generate the outputs using the, count, the counter for output. Um, what happens in this particular case is that the hardware counter uh, constantly compares the free running counter that's in the timer counter with a value stored in this compare and capture register here and the output of that timer uh, OC ref that you can see can either be high or low so that's why we get that pulse width modulated type of signal uh, and it can be high or low depending on the particular timer setting it says here uh, when the function of the timer is output the CCR register is used only for compare so this is why compare is highlighted in that particular slide the timer can also be used for input capture and that's what's highlighted here in this particular case we've got the capture highlighted and what happens in that case is when a specific external event occurs such as a, a rising edge uh, or a falling edge from an external signal or GPI, GPIO pin the hardware automatically copies the current value of the timer counter and <clears throat> and copies it into this uh, uh, compare and capture register so it's going to put it in there and that gives us this you know the count and timing information that we need um, to signal some particular event now by, cal by calculating the difference between two recorded compare and capture register times we can then measure the period or the pulse width of an input signal. Um, so anyways, we're going to specifically look at um, more using the timer in this lecture uh, to generate a pulse width modulated signal. But that's, you know, for capture, you can use it to capture multiple times and multiple times can give you the frequency or whatnot of an input signal. Okay, so this is an important slide because it talks about um, the different uh, timer outputs and you can see, okay, we've talked about, okay, we can have internal or external or internal tr triggers for the clock controller that can, can you know, then we can prescale the clock um, with this prescaler PSC register to then slow down the clock and that's what controls the timer. We have the auto reload register that controls you know what the counter can count to or whatnot with uh, up and down counting which we'll talk about. Um, and then what is important here though is we have it shows for a particular timer we have four capture and compare registers. Well, okay, that's important because that means you can do four different things if you're doing, if you're using each one of those capture and compare registers. And so it says here, okay, well, if it's 
counter is greater than CCR1, CCR2, CCR3, CCR4, if you set um, those compare registers to different values, then you can have different signals coming out for channel 1 through channel 4 there. And so that's nice because you can get multiple uh, signals from just one timer. And that means multiple pulse width modulated outputs can have overall the exact same period, but they could have a different on time versus off time for each one of those four signals. Um, and that would happen because that CCR register for, uh, for each one of these would have a different value. Now the counter, now that's not changing, it's just the CCR1, CCR2, CCR3, CCR4 are set to different values. Okay, so now let's look at this output compare. Again, that's what we're talking about when we want to generate our pulse width modulated signal. So here is what it's talking about. Here's the timer counter that's always counting. It's got this clock signal applied to it. And you see here it's saying, okay, it could count up or count down. And we're going to compare this to a constant value. That's the CCR value that we had. And we're going to compare those. And then, you know, based on that comparison, we're going to generate some interrupt or something uh, when they're the same. So that's basically saying, you know, in this case, the counter is going to count up or it's going to count down. And when we get to the value of the CCR, then we're going to do something. And since that timer has the availability of doing four different uh, CCRs, then we could do four different things because it's got four different comparators. So here is, it talks about this different output compare mode. And it says, OK, we could freeze the timer. Um, so sort of like it's disabled in some sense. Um, if we set the output compare mode to 001, that means the hot, it's going to go high if the count is equal to CCR. 010 means it's going to go low if the count is equal to CCR. 011 is going to toggle. So if it was high, it's going to go low. If it was low, it's going to go high. And then these two are going to basically force the timer output to be low and always low or high and always high. So as you can imagine, the main ones we're really concerned with are like going to be those. Okay, so let's talk about generating these pulse width modulated signals. And I want to talk uh, specifically about what will happen in the situation um, where you set up, you know, set it up for up, up counting at first and then we'll talk about the other situations in a minute. It has two modes of operation and of course you can imagine here with this particular table that it's sort of like they're the opposite of each other. We can have pulse width modulated mode one which basically is saying a low is true and they're trying to distinguish here in your book about okay, what is the logic level, like act, negative active logic or positive active logic? I think you talked a bit about that in 235. And so low is true is basically mean low is what we normally think of. The low voltage is the one. And this one is saying, okay, for mode two, the high voltage is the one. It's just a different way you can think about it. And so it's showing here when the counter is less than the reference, it's active, and when the counter is greater than or equal to the reference, it's inactive. Well, when it's active, that means, you know, it would be low here, and then it means high here. And so it's obviously you see it's the reverse case for mode two. So I think this is, there's nothing wrong with having this mode one or mode two, um, but Obviously, the thing that is going to, you know, different, differentiate the two is if you have some event that you think is going to be only on or active for a small amount of time, you might want to make that have the low being the active. 
or excuse me, the high being the active. But if you expect the event um, where the high is not going to happen, uh, but for just a little bit, then maybe you want the opposite case. In other words, you're sort of trying to concern yourself again with power. But in terms of just doing the signals, they're going to flip-flop based on the one you, you have. Okay, so this is talking about um, what's happening with the counter. So the counter is going to always be counting up, and then it, you know, when it gets to its auto reload value, it's going to go back down and then count back up again, and go down and then count back up again. So that's going to keep counting every time that uh, the clock signal hits it. Okay, so if our reference signal is at this value, what it's trying to say is, okay, what is going to happen in this particular case? If the counter value is greater than the reference, so you can see what we're trying to do is doing the pulse width modulated mode 2, that's why it's highlighted in red here, that means when the counter is greater than the reference, we're going to be active, and this Active means high is going to be active, so we're going to get a high voltage. So when do we have that situation? Well, the counter is always counting up. When does the counter get bigger than the reference? Just this period right here. And so when we get that counter actually higher than the reference signal, we're going to be in this case and we're going to be on. So that's why this voltage goes to V, because we're saying high is true. So then it's uh, low all the other time. So all of this time it's low. Again, after the count comes back down, it's going to be low again until we get to this segment, and then it's going to be high, and so forth. And it's going to be repetitive. So it shows here that we have this T on time and T off time. Now one thing that's important here is it's trying to show, oh, okay, what's the average output? Now this is sort of what goes along with that brightness setting or the motor setting. You're basically, when you're switching this on and off relatively quickly, what that looks like is the average value of it. Again, and this is like the root mean square kind of thinking for a signal, the average value over the <clears throat> whole time is going to be lower. So obviously, if I set my reference signal down here and the counter was counting up and it was on the whole time, then my average value would be V, because it's V the whole time and it's always that way. Um, so the more time you're on, the more you're going to approach V with this method. Okay, so now let's look um, at some more cases that are a little bit more specific, and we'll talk about the pulse width modulated values that come out when we do this. So we're going to set our auto reload register at 6, so that means it's going to count up to 6, and the repetition counter register is going to be set at 0. Um, we're going to count up. So we're up counting, and we're going to do the edge align mode, which means it's going to count up and just count up and go back down, and go back to zero and start over. Okay, so what happens? Here we show the clock running the whole time, and you can see the counter. It's important here to realize that the counter starts at zero, and it's going to count up to this ARR value, six, and then an overflow is going to occur after it happens, and it's going to go back to zero, count back up to six. Then an overflow is going to happen, it's going to go to zero, count back up to six. Okay, now you can see what's trying to show here is this overflow update event occurs, and that the way that's going to hit is going to go high, and then it's going to go back low. So <clears throat> we can we can look at this. Um, overflow update event to count things that happen if we need to in terms of you know if we wanted to know the length of time was going something like this 
we can look at that and use that information, have a separate counter counting these update events to let us know that certain lengths of time have gone, have occurred. Okay, so what else can we say about this? Well, <clears throat> what's the period of overall count? Now this is something to be careful about and I want to make sure you see. Okay, it says here it's one plus ARR. Why one plus? That's because there's one segment, two segments, three segments, four segments, five segments, six seven segments, seven segments. So since ARR is six, it's going to be ARR plus one segments of time of these, you know, clocks here. So we have seven of those in this case, so that's why it's ARR plus one times the clock period. Now remember that's the the clock after it's been prescaled by whatever value you have. So that's important to note as we count. Okay, now notice um, it's called edge align because it always lines up at this edge right here. And we'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go through it. So what about edge align mode with down counting? Okay, we're gonna have the same scenario where this ARR is six and the repetition counter is zero. Now we're gonna count down from six to zero and the only difference is we have the counter underflows occurring but it stores that in the same thing. It's still an update event uh, and so it doesn't really matter. It's not an underflow or overflow. Notice it didn't it's not a different flag, it's the same flag for each case. Uh, and again, you have the same thing going on here. Um, <clears throat> but uh, one thing I will, oops. Let me go back to the up counting. So notice um, that this is occurring at the left edge of the count as it goes down. Because right, if we start the count, at six and we're going down, this is occurring at the same as the left edge of that count as it starts and goes. Whereas, on the other hand, where does this one occur? It occurs at the right edge because we start counting and it goes up and it goes, so it's the right edge of the count. And it taught, not that that really matters much, but they call that right edge or left edge aligned. Now, what happens in the center align mode? This is the one that's sort of different. Um, this is a count up and then count down. So we're going to see what happens when we set this auto reload register to six, repetition counter register at zero. Okay, what happens is we count up to six, then down back to zero. And we trigger an update event when it gets to six, so when it gets to ARR, and we trigger it when it gets back to zero. So now notice what happens though, is in this case we have zero, one, excuse me, zero, that's terrible. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, there's 12 segments there in time for this center line mode. And so it's gonna be ARR times two, whatever that is, to give you the period. And now notice, since it's gonna be multiplied by two, it doesn't matter if AR is even or odd, the overall period is gonna be double and that's 
what makes this mode nice. You're going to have a nice symmetric signal if you use center line mode. And it shows that here, here's the 2 times the ARR times the overall clock period. And so this center line mode can be nice. And again, this update event occurs at the <clears throat> when the counter hits ARR and then it counts back down to zero and when it hits zero. So it generates an overflow or underflow each time and that update event will occur. Okay, now notice this one is going to try to show you an example of pulse width mode mod pulse width modulated mode one. Let's go back to that slide and make sure we understand what that was again. We did this back here and I don't. Mode one is this one. So it's active if the counter is less than the reference and it's inactive if the counter is greater than the uh, reference. And it's also low if true. So let's see what happens here when we go to that one. Okay. There's that low of true part. And mode one says the timer output is high if counter is less than CCR, low if counter is greater than CCR. Okay. And now what that's going to tell us is about this OC ref signal. Now again, we have to be careful because this low, high, all that stuff can be confusing, but we're, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go through this example. Okay, so we're up counting, right, to 6. Our CCR is 3, so remember that's what gets compared for the output compare is when does ARR and CR, excuse me, when does the timer counter compare to CCR and what happens? Okay, if CCR is three, that's obviously gonna hit something at these points in time. So, as we count up, we're gonna, mode one says we're gonna go high if the counter is less than CCR. So as we're counting up, we normally think of the high should be here until we get to three. Once it gets to three, it's gonna go low. So we're gonna go low for that period. Here it shows that three, as I said, and what happens? So I said, high if we're there, low if we're, the counter is above that. So this is what makes sense for us there. And then it shows, okay, what's the duty cycle? The duty cycle is going to be CCR 3 because in this case it's 1, 2, 3, whatever CCR is that portion of the overall portion of segments, which is ARR plus one. So this is how you can get the duty cycle. And then this tells you about the overall period. So that's the period from here to here, but we talked about that in the previous slide. Okay, so this is mode one. Um, And we discussed this particular, what happens here about being high if the counter is less than CCR, low if it's greater than CCR. So that makes sense here. Now that didn't tell you about the voltage, right? So I think the voltage in this case says low voltage if true. So the voltage would actually be the opposite of this. Um, we'd have a low voltage here and a high voltage here. Now notice we're switching to mode two, which is high of true. And mode two says 
the opposite here. Low if the counter is less than CCR, high if the counter is greater than CCR. Okay, so we're going to count up to six again, right? The CCR is three. So we're going to be low for here, high for here. And that's what we see for that. And so since that's since the normal duty cycle would be full duty cycle would be 100% to get the duty cycle for this we can say oh it's 1 minus this so in this case it will give us 4 sevenths. Okay, let's stick with PWM mode 2 again. But let's look at the example just to make sure we've got it of CCR being 5. And again, remember, we're going to be low if the counter is less than CCR, high if the counter is greater than CCR. So our magic line will be here, as you'll see. So we're going to be low in this region, high in this region. So we should see something like this. And you'll see that's what comes across here. And again, our duty cycle is one. Since we're doing mode two, we take CCR because it's only going to be, it looks like CCR is large, but it's five. So it's going to be five over seven. And one could be written as 7 over 7, so it's 1 minus 5 over 7, so 7 minus 5 or 2 over 7. So that's how we can get the duty cycle. But just remember, if you're doing PWM mode 2, we have to do this subtraction. If we're doing mode 1, we don't have to do the subtraction. It's just the CCR over AR plus 1. And we can get the clock, the period overall, too. Okay, so now let's look at PWM mode 2 again with center line mode so it's going to we're going to do the counting up to six and back down to zero our ccr is going to be three and the rcr the repetition counter register is going to be zero so you can see the level here is set at three and if our mode two says we're going to be high if the counter is greater than ccr so for this length of time the counter is greater than or equal to ccr so that's why we have high here we have low the other portion. And now notice what that ha does to us though is <clears throat> the period is really, um, what do you want to say, this whole section. And the nice thing about this um, or maybe I should, I could say that whole section, I could also say this section, but that's really the same overall period both ways. But it, what, what's nice about the center line mode is it's symmetric and you don't have to worry about things being off. Um, and notice here, it gives you the, the duty cycle. And since um, CR, CCR and AR uh, are half of each other, then you can see how easy it is to get the duty cycle of a half. And then we can get the overall clock period from being uh, the, the two times the auto reload register times the clock period here, which turns out to be 12. So the center line mode is actually really nice because it can be used to easily generate symmetric um, signals. So let's just look at one last example. Here you can see we've let CCR be 1. So we're going to be, if we're doing mode 2, we're going to be on a lot longer than we're going to be off. And I guess I should point out one thing. Um, when this works this way, you know, I like to think of this as the way it actually counts. But do realize, okay, 
it does work that way when we're counting up. It goes high when we get there. But when we're coming back down, it still stays on the high output. Excuse me. It changes from the high output to the low output when it gets equal to here. So just realize on the down count, it switches back to low here. And that's what, of course, makes it overall symmetric um, so that you get the same you know, consistency on each side of the, the wave. I didn't put, point that out on the last slide, but it's important to see that, okay, overall we're high this period for mode two and low for this period. And so we get the symmetrics, uh, the wave being symmetric, again, using that same formula for the duty cycle and the same formula for that period from the uh, last slide. Okay, so let's look at this auto reload register and talk about it for just a little bit. Um, there's an auto reload preload enable um, in the timer control register one. And you can see here, um, it allows you to, you know, you can write to the ARR or read from the ARR register. Um, and it's sort of, uh, buffered into this preload register that goes into the ARR register itself. So you you know if a if an update event occurs um, within a clock cycle or whatever, you can have some triggering. But if, as clock cycles go along, you can have one ARR and the next clock cycle after it's been buffered and put into it, you can switch ARRs. Um, you can also do it asynchronously that it talks about here and then it doesn't happen after the clock signal, it happens immediately. Um, you can see here you have the ability if you want to to disable um, update events with that update disable flag right there as well. Now let's talk about the repetition counter register. Um, that's what this is talking about right here. Um, not PCR, RCR. Um, <clears throat> anyways, the repetition counter, what happens if you're doing um, repetition counter, it's sort of like the prescaler kind of thing um, where it's basically saying when update events are going to occur. When you have the repetition counter uh, register being zero, every update event actually gets counted. So you can see where it, for the center line where it's zero and then it, where it gets to AR and then when it goes back to zero, each one of these events gets counted as an update event. For up counting, it's each time it gets, it, it starts at zero and then it resets each time. Each one of those gets counted for the up counting or down counting. And notice again, you see sort of this down counting sort of shows you where you have the right aligned and left aligned kind of edge aligned uh, systems. Um, okay, when we set the repetition counter register to one, basically that skips every other update event. So it will look like at each countdown to zero of the counter align mode or each other, so that when it hits, don't get one there, get one here, don't get one there, get one here. But I assume here that if, if somehow you started counting and you were here, that you would get each one of those update events. So the, the main point is it skips every other update event that normally would occur if you have the repetition counter register being one. If it's two, it skips two. So it's easiest to see here. Here we would have one, we should have one here, so it's skipped. We should have one here, so it's skipped. 
then we do get the next one. So in this case, it looks like it's going to get when uh, the when the counter goes to zero, and then when it goes to ARR, and then goes to zero, and then goes to ARR. So it's a little bit different. But here you can clearly see we've got one. We should have one at the where it restarts and doesn't count that first one, doesn't count that second one, and so forth. So this repetition counter register basically um, just shows you how to skip update events if you feel like you need to in terms of maybe having too many update events occurring at one, you know, because your resolution is really fine, but at the same time you don't really want to decrease the fineness because maybe something else needs that fine uh, control. And then here it is with um, being three. So again you can see it's skip, 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 or skip, skip, skip. Um, anyways, it tells you how you can, how many update events you can skip before it counts it again. Now this talks about what happens if you do this repetition counter register and you allow resynchronization. So it's basically showing uh, what happens by software. Even if you had it at three, when you resynchronize right here, it would start counting again and then skip one, skip two, skip three, and go. So even though in this case it would only skip two there and then it starts to go up, because it gets resynchronized, you're going to start it with an update event and then skip three and so forth. Again, that's sort of a software resynchronization where you, you've done something. Okay, so the pulse width mode op output polarity is something that's important and I think can be confusing a little bit. We talked about mode 1 and mode 2 being active and inactive. There's also this output polarity bit, which is the CCXP, so that's the CCXP bit in the particular timer. Um, this is sort of like a control register. And by that, what this is basically saying, the normal polarity that we think of is active high. So it's like positive active. And so when we think when we think we have um, you know the the high level for the timer that would correspond to a high voltage. When we have the low value of the timer it corresponds to a low voltage and that go corresponds with this polarity bit. If we switch the polarity bit then we can do the opposite of that where the high on the output is actually a low voltage and so forth. So it's confusing but just remember basically all you're ever doing is flip-flopping which way it goes. Okay, so the counting up and counting down and the center counting are something that we always talked about as we went through and um, did the particular uh, counts. And it just basically tells you how you're going to get to the auto reload value and then reset and go back and forth. So this slide I think is particularly telling you something important about what happens if you have two different CCR values for two different signals. So remember you have four CCR registers so if you set you know CCR1 and CCR2 to be different three and six in this case um, you have the ability to get uh, notice this is mode one here it's not really saying that but we have high if it's less than the count low if it's greater than the count value so um, here we have this ability and we get two pulse width modulated uh, symbols at the same time this talks about this left edge alignment because the left edge, since we have mode 1, 
and we have this particular thing right here where it resets to count at zero for the up counting mode, the, the left edges are always aligned. It doesn't really matter much, I think, in the way you see this, but it's just saying, okay, the left edge of every pulse that you have is going to be aligned there. Um, now for mode two, though, it's going to be opposite of that. It's going to be right edge aligned. And so that's noticing here, um, it's basically saying here that same thing, now we have high for OC2 ref that it's showing here in that region, high for OC1 ref when we're in this region. Oops, this region, sorry. And, and we get this right align signal that aligns at the right side of the edge of the pulse as it counts up. So one is right side and this is left side. So when it lines up at the beginning of the counting, it's left edge aligned. When it lines up at the end of the counting, it's right edge aligned. And what I mean by end of the counting is when it gets to its peak value and resets. And then uh, again, this is talking about what happens for the center line mode. Um, again, this is mode two. So high throughout this region above this one for OC1, high in this one region for OC2. And again, I'm not being careful about the countdown part, but I should put right there. So again, you get this nice symmetric waves and it shows here how they indeed are center aligned over the entire period. And that's important. Okay, so the next part is how do we do all this with the different control bits and so forth. So we're going to talk about these control bits as we go through the next particular set of slides and how we're going to go uh, control everything with software.